Mary Beth Ellis. Do I thank you first or them first? Thank you and you. Just do it both at the same time. So last week was my birthday. Shut up, I hate my birthday. My birthday is January 15th, and the problem with having a birthday on January 15th is your life is one unending slideshow of everyone you know being broke and on a diet and on the wagon again. And uh, I'd like to share with you just a few of these specific presents I have received for my birthday in chronological order. An actual blizzard, a geometry final, a speeding ticket, getting dumped, having to watch the Bengals in the postseason. So one year, I decided to escape from all this and spend my 30th birthday in the biggest hole in the ground I could find. Now, it didn't really feel like 30 was any kind of calamity, but all of the internet information and all of movies and fonts of knowledge such, such as the television show Friends were telling me that this was the worst thing that, that could possibly happen to me. I was a lot stupider then. Now I know that you should get most of your life information from the crown. <laughs> so the biggest hole I could think of was the Grand Canyon. I love the West. It is so rugged and wild and skyy. I'm a professional writer. That, that's a thing. It's a word. I just made it skyy. And I felt this way ever since I was a child when I first walked a little bit of the way down the South Rim Trail called the Bright Angel Trail. And I saw this amazing sign that said, caution, down is optional, up is mandatory. <laughs> Very exotic for a child from Ohio. So there are two ways to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. You can walk or you can take a mule train. I'm from the west side. We don't walk. <laughs> Walking is for east siders who drink beer in a glass and... <laughs> and have sculpted dogs who get visits from mobile pet spas. And, and it's just not the type of thing that we do. So that left the mule train. And that was a problem because tickets on the mule train aren't exactly cheap. Apparently the mules have to eat or something. So another thing you should know about me is I'm unemployable. It seems that my master's of creative writing in nonfiction and my bachelor of arts in English and political science with a minor in revolutionary studies in early American history is off trend of the job market. <laughs> but in one of my greatest achievements, I managed to scrape together enough money to get a deposit down for this trip to the Grand Canyon. And then my boyfriend had to go and screw and go and screw everything up by proposing. So that meant I had to take the money from the deposit to have a wedding on the west side, which will not be recognized by the Roman Catholic Church unless there was a DJ playing everybody have fun tonight at the reception. <laughs> So I had to get on the phone to the National Park Service and tell the mules I wasn't coming for my birthday. And the customer service agent saw how upset and bummed I was, and she showed love and solidarity by putting me on hold for 10 minutes. And I sat there holding the phone, and I was fine until the flute got there. The hold music was a Navajo flute melody, and it was so authentic and so unauto-tuned and so real that I started to cry because 
all of a sudden I realized turning 30 is a calamity. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do about it. I mean, I was getting married, but what was I giving up to make that happen? My autonomy, my independence, the full extension of my limbs, the ability to eat peach taffy for breakfast, gone. I didn't know what to do about it. I wasn't the internationally famous writer, writer that 14-year-old me assumed I would be. I wasn't a mother, and I wasn't sure if I even wanted to be a mother, and somehow not knowing whether or not I wanted to be a mother was more scary than actually being a mother. It was scary at the time, trust me. It made sense. It was terrifying. I was a mostly unpublished, part-time college English teacher who failed six-page essays that consisted of a single paragraph for a living. What else was I going to do? My husband, on the other hand, is extremely useful. He's a pilot. And the really great thing about being a pilot, even if you are an excellent pilot like he is, is you are going to get laid off at some point, especially in a crap economy. As a matter of fact, the major thing that unites me and my husband and really cements our relationship is the number of times he and I, individually and as a couple, have been laid off. But down is optional, up is mandatory. So on our first anniversary, my husband brought me a tiny little cactus in a tiny little pot, and he said, I know that you had to use the money from your mule trip so that we could afford to get married. So this serves as a symbol of my promise to you that at some point, you are going to take that trip. You will wake up on your birthday at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Then we went out and celebrated by getting laid off. Now, all of this getting laid off has caused a lot of expensive moving. And always, my husband, the cactus, and I traveled as a trio. We started out in a purchased townhome in Leesburg, Virginia, and then wound up in a rented townhouse in Leesburg, Virginia, and then Oklahoma City, and then Fairhope, Alabama and then Sarah Land, Alabama, and just to mix things up, Mobile, Alabama, and always cactus came with it. It grew bigger and taller and required repotting, and because I'm a very creative person, I named it cactus. <laughs> so cactus came with us, and at one point, we were seven years in the marriage, and I looked at my husband and I said, I just remembered who I am. I am a fifth generation West Sider. Where we are born, we stay, if only to come back to die and hit up one more parish festival. <laughs> the gravitational pull of I-275 is too strong for me. The tractor beam keeps pulling me in. So we moved back to Cincinnati and into my parents' basement. At least I got my hole in the ground. <laughs> and then we moved up into a terrifying apartment complex across the parking lot from my parents' basement, and then into a rental house two blocks from my parents' basement. And at one point, my husband looked at me not long after this last move, and he said, you're going to be 40 soon. I said, that's not a good way to start a conversation. <laughs> he said, no, the airline I'm working for now, we can fly standby for free anywhere we want. And this might not be the most financially responsible decision, but I think you've waited long enough. And we are going to take that trip to the Grand Canyon. You are going to wake up on the morning of your 40th birthday at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So we pet it cactus in his now giant pot and we flew to Arizona. And I knew it had to be my birthday there in Arizona, which is mostly desert, because I was standing there, Arizona, desert, 31 degrees freezing rain. <laughs> and I looked out at the magnificent Grand Canyon, one of the seven wonders of the world, which was now a few inches deeper and a few inches wider 
than it was when I first saw it as a little girl thanks to the mighty carving motion of the Colorado River. And I gazed out into a giant bank of fog. Not to worry, the mules were on the way. The, the mule string came running up into the corral and they tossed their heads and came thundering around and they stomped their hooves and kind of shoved around at each other until they eventually settled down to just looking pissed off. And I realized that even the most stubborn things in this old world might experience movement. Then it was time for Alan. Alan was the head wrangler and it was his job to take these pilots and English majors and soccer moms and insurance adjusters in and out of the Grand Canyon in one piece. And to that end, he delivered the following speech. It was entitled, I don't care about your feelings. <laughs> I loved this speech. More people need to hear this speech. And in my many, 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 many jobs. Many of them have involved customer service and I have often wanted people to die. <laughs> and here was Alan selflessly working for the opposite. And here is what he said. He said, now, if you don't follow directions, we might have a problem. No one has ever died on a Grand Canyon mule train unless they don't follow directions. If you don't follow directions, you could die. Once we get to the bottom of the canyon, if you experience some sort of medical emergency, there's no way we're going to be able to reach you. You're probably going to die. <laughs> On the way in or out, the terrain is very rough. If you get injured, we will not be able to reach you for a very long time. You're going to be in agonizing pain for a very long time, and you're probably going to wish you were going to die. And my husband said, happy birthday. <laughs> so we continued my celebration of life by mounting up and heading down a little bit past the rim. And at that point, our Navajo guide stopped us. And he said, everyone, turn your mules to face the canyon. I'm going to sing a blessing. And this blessing is going to ask the keeper of the canyon to watch over us during our journey. And he took his hat off, and he turned his face into the freezing rain, and he began to sing. And his voice echoed off the ancient rocks, and I am telling you it was the same song that I heard 10 years ago when I was on hold canceling those original reservations. And I was at one with the guide, and at one with the rocks, and at one with the wildflowers, and the insurance adjuster next to me on his phone, and at one with my husband, and at one with my mule, and I began to cry. And my mule, being at one with me, began to pee. At the bottom of the canyon, we all stayed in these teeny tiny little cabins, extremely basic. There was no Wi-Fi, no DVR, no books. There was nothing to do but talk to each other. And my husband and I lay there in this tiny little cabin side by side, and we talked to each other. And we toasted each other with $12 beers from the canyon canteen, until I had to run out of the tiny little cabin to throw up. Because, my friends, sometimes in life, down is optional, up is mandatory. <laughs> On the way back up to the rim the next day, my husband spread the word that it was my birthday, and the whole group sang to me. They sang, happy birthday, and it was a happy birthday, even though I had spent it doing something with other people that was far more frightening to me than originally planning to do it on my own. And when we got home, I ran to tell Cactus all about it. But Cactus wasn't home. Cactus was draped over the side of his now very large pot. I know. I know. I should have been sad because we laid him to rest respectfully at the bottom of a rumpke container. But it wasn't really sad, because 
nothing, even being on hold, is permanent. And whether we know it or not, and whether we run the risk of being in agonizing pain for an extremely long time or not, we are always in forward motion. For down is optional and up is mandatory. Thank you. One more time for Mary Beth.